is 5G or its follow-on generation, the work on which has already started 6G, a game changer? What can it do for us as a society? How we can benefit from this technology to change our lives and the ways how we do a lot of things in our lives? Thank you for your introduction. Just briefly highlighting, I am also uh, uh, a member of the Scotland 5G Centre and principal investigator for the urban testbed that Scotland 5G Centre has deployed in Scotland. And I am head of communication sensing and imaging research group at University of Glasgow, which has around 110 researchers, uh, uh, including PhD students working on the advancement of communication technologies. I come from University of Glasgow, so a very brief introduction about the universities in place as well. It's world's uh, fourth oldest English speaking university. And it was founded in 1451. And it's one of the top 100 universities in university world rankings. And it's very proud to have produced uh, the giants in engineering, like, like Lord Ranking, James Watt, uh, and many other scientists. So it makes our job as current researchers in University of Glasgow very challenging to uh, follow in the footsteps of these great giants. As a university, we have made great contributions towards uh, 5G, especially in the nation of Scotland and more widely in the United Kingdom. And uh, uh, Scotland's 5G policy was announced by the First Minister of Scotland uh, in our labs. We have also contributed to other uh, development of uh, uh, 5G technology across uh, not just UK, but the globe as well. So what is 5G? So a question many people ask, what is 5G? So if you, if you want to understand, it's definitely a faster, more efficient and better wireless or mobile connectivity service. So people are aware, have been using 3G, and many people are lucky to be using 4G now. And uh, if you just take an example of how long would it take to download the two hour long Guardians of the Galaxy video. So with 3G, it would take more than a day. With 4G, it takes just six minutes. And with 5G, it will take less than what it takes to blink your eye. So that's in short what 5G is. Will 6G be making it even faster? Do we need, need to make it even faster? The answer is no. Speed is good enough now. Even six minutes was fine. If someone wants to download a video, they cannot watch it in six minutes. So they can wait for six minutes, right? So the challenge here is not just increasing the speed, but 5G is more than just a speed. And that's important to understand. So what else it can do for us? First of all, 5G also overcomes some limitations of 3G and 4G in terms of how many devices can be connected per unit area simultaneously. And this is important. Why this is important? Because so far we have been um, we have been very keen on connecting people only. People used to have mobile phone. At max, they would have three, four devices, a variable watch as well as a mobile phone and so on. But in future, we want to allow for any hardware to be connected to the internet. And there could be good reasons for that. So simple example, which many people are already seeing in their lives is connecting your household appliances or your lights. And you can then control them through internet while you're away anywhere in the world, right? So this requires a lot of devices requiring simultaneous and live connection with the mobile or wireless network. That's called massive IoT, internet of things. So that's one other aspect that 5G tries to enhance from the previous generations. More devices can be connected simultaneously in any given uh, square area, unit area. The other important aspect is to reduce the latency of communication. And latency can be understood for those people who have either experienced online gaming or who have, uh, for example, in the past experienced those extreme latency examples when people used to communicate using voice over IP. So Skype, when it came, very early in uh, the beginning of this century, the communication over Skype was always terrible. People were spending a lot of time in just asking each other, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Not Because of the delay in how your voice reaches the destination, it was very difficult to have real-time conversations. So now the problem is not that acute, but there are still applications like online gaming or like controlling some mission critical infrastructure from a remote location, which is still dependent and sensitive to latencies of even 
several hundreds of milliseconds. So we have to bring down this latency to tens of milliseconds. So that's another aspect. So these aspects are hidden from a normal end user of the technology, but these are very important to enable some new use cases that, as I will explain today. So will 5G will be the final generation? The answer is again, no, because there is a lot of work. 5G has now been standardized and it's now being deployed across the globe. So there is further requirement to develop it and fine tune it further. That's why work in research and development has already started for the next generation of technology, which is 6G, which will increase several other aspects of wireless connectivity. So there is a very uh, popular and very well-cited uh, speculative study uh, of 6G, and I have been lucky to be a contributor to this study. So I will highlight few, very few uh, salient points about what 6G will do, which currently is not possible uh, in, in, with the current system. And one of the most interesting things that 6G will enable us is to communicate our senses. So far, with wireless communication or with any uh, communication, the senses that we have focused on communicating include my voice, video, right? And this has been gradually improving. So previously, for example, uh, voice was okay, but music could not be communicated over telephone line uh, with high fidelity. Now it can be. With video as well, previously video was of very low quality. Now you can communicate 4K, high definition video. And even now we are moving where we can now communicate uh, three-dimensional video streams over the internet or over even a wireless link. So these two senses, we are very well accustomed to being communicated over a distance and being reproduced using uh, the current existing engineering solutions. Now we are going beyond that. So one of the immediate other sense that we want to now communicate is touch. And why touch is important? Because if someone is controlling something from a distance, they want to feel the texture and they want to get some tactile or pressure feedback of how that physical thing is being controlled. So touch will be the next sense that needs to be effectively communicated over long distances. And that will maybe follow on with taste and smell. But taste and smell are very much linked together. You can even create a perception of taste by generating the right smells. This is fascinating, but an important aspect to uh, cover. Now, how do we do that? So in uh, our research group and across the globe, we are uh, promoting this kind of balanced research approach. This is slightly technical, but I'm sure everyone will understand even if they don't have technical background. That uh, survey that was done just before this uh, presentation was very useful for me as well to understand who are the audience. So this is called a technology readiness level scale. So TRL1 means something which is a blue sky idea, right? Uh, for example, time travel, right? I have to work on it. I have to even physically, mathematically prove is it possible or not possible. So these are technology readiness level one. Uh, unique blue sky idea, which is ne not ready to be physically deployed and commercially exploited. At the other extreme is TRL9, where uh, ideas are commercially deployable and exploitable. Companies are using it to make money. So the job of the researchers is to do a very balanced approach of fundamental research to generate new ideas, to prove that they can work, and also help industry to move these ideas from TRL1 to TRL9. So that's what we do in our research group. We work on fundamentals in 5G area, for example, proving that self-organized networking, a human-less management of wireless controlled systems is possible, how we can run those networks at very low energy cost using solar panels even, and how we can achieve the capacity limits that theory defines. And at the same time, we are developing tests and trial working jointly and collaboratively with industrial partners, optimize the system and commercialize those ideas. And that is reflected in our uh, citations as well, which do not just come from academic institutions, but also from industrial partners as well. Our main innovation in enabling 5G and not just enabling it, but allowing it to reach the rural and far-fetched areas as well is to reduce the operating cost and the capital expenditure to deploy a 5G network. And how we do that, we make it uh, free of requirement of a human expert to run, configure, optimize, and heal the network. This is called a self-organized networking. It has artificial intelligence inspired by human experience as well as networks experience in order to run it independent of 
or minimize human intervention. We also using this technology, we also enable a lot of other use cases which are interesting for, uh, for many people in their day-to-day -day life. And I will go through some of them in more detail uh, as, as they come along during the presentation. We don't just generate those ideas and we don't just try theoretical formulations and simulations to show that these ideas work. We have been lucky to have some funding from the Scotland 5G Center, the Scottish government, to deploy a live outdoor urban test network using state-of-the-art 5G technology to develop these use cases and deploy them on a campus. And what would be a better example of a small or smart city than a living campus like University of Glasgow, where uh, not just students live or use the states and facilities, but it's a permeable campus where everyday users, commuters, walkers, they go through the network, they go through the campus. It's integrated into city infrastructure, west end of the city of, of, of Glasgow. So what are the use cases that we look? So important one is uh, evaluation or surveillance of uh, people as well as infrastructure uh, for security. And that has to be done nowadays with fixed CCTV cameras. But in future, it will be done with mobile CCTV cameras. Even people who are riding bicycles and wearing a webcam, which is connected to the internet, will become part of a sensing device for surveillance. And this requires a lot of uh, further development in order to enable low latency, high throughput, mobile connectivity. Augmented reality and virtual reality can transform how the uh, education, training, as well as, con uh, as, well as communication of information uh, can be enhanced. Connected health devices. So a lot of people wearing healthcare devices, but we are also looking at how we can move away from the need to wear those devices. Can we do it remotely without any wearable device? Uh, in enhancing the security of the internet of things. So these bulbs, everything that is now living with me in my house, has to be secure and privacy preserved. Pop-up network is a use case where in response to a disaster or for managing a large event like India Science Festival, for example, when it is being organized in an uh, open location, how to provide uh, pop-up digital connectivity for these kind of events. Wireless control, how we can control robotic arms and other devices from a remote distance so that people can dispense of their skill jobs from a distance. And finally, vehicles to be connected to anything. This is in short called V2X, vehicle to anything. And the main idea is in future, these vehicles, many of them, they will be driverless or others will be relying on a lot of information which is coming through these connected infrastructure onto the vehicle. And each one of them we are doing with certain um, world leaders or industrial partners, as well as we are doing a lot of fundamental research on different uh, technologies which enable them. And there are a lot of acronyms and I wouldn't confuse the audience with those acronyms. What is sufficient to say here is that these are those fundamental engineering technologies which work on different layers of communication infrastructure to enable these exciting use cases for future. So let's uh, very briefly visit some of these use cases. So in future, there will be technology that will be able to provide your health vitals information, for example, your breathing rate, your pulse and many other things without you requiring to wear things. Why we are so much against wearing different devices? Because people forget about them and some, they do not really want to wear them. And some are in that old age where it's impossible for them to keep remembering that they have to wear these healthcare devices. And this goes beyond that. So for example, uh, it not only monitors your micro activities, but it can also monitor your macro, macro activities as well. There, I'm sure there will be a question about privacy preservation. I can answer it then, but it is sufficient to say that this will all be done while your privacy is preserved using technology again. Uh, there is a huge potential of using augmented reality and virtual reality to enhance anyone's work space or experience during large events or during visits to different places. Uh, virtual reality can also be used to open up specialized lab facilities that some rich universities are lucky to have to be accessed by people anywhere in the world for their training and for their access. And then uh, healthcare is being transformed using this technology from a proactive healthcare where we contact a doctor when something gets wrong 
to a reactive healthcare where, where we are actually reacting to some situ- situation to a proactive healthcare where technology is actually monitoring us and technology can identify any early onset of different unwanted conditions and it can then alert the medical health authorities in advance and they can then take an early action which has a better chance for uh, recovering from that that disease so this is the proactive or future looking healthcare system so we are working on uh, moving from this reactive to a future proactive healthcare technology then uh, i have already said enough about uh, why people sometimes don't want to have wearable devices they are intrusive they require continuous wearing sometimes they are invasive as well so for example they invade your privacy so intrusive because some of them they have to be mounted physically in your body with a small incision or or, or that that kind of uh, process as well so this raises privacy concerns this raises environmental constraints and it has much higher cost as well so we are moving towards this contactless mechanism difficult to explain but what is sufficient to say is just like sometimes we can uh, predict what's happening in a room just by looking at shadows moving on the walls just like that with wireless signals as well you can predict what's happening in the room just by visualizing what changes are happening in the channel state quality or channel state information in that room due to the movement of people or even subtle movements of for example uh, when i'm breathing this creates some uh, some subtle changes in wireless channel quality if we can detect them and if we can correlate them with the activity happening in the room then we can we are we can enable ourselves to uh, monitor people without installing a new hardware or equipment in their houses this is really useful because even if we are not doing it for a positive purpose people might try to do it for any negative reason so we have to make sure that this technology is used in a privacy preserved secure and reliable manner so there is a road map to achieve this uh, vision in either 5g or in 6g technology so we started with a single subject activity monitoring which we have achieved single subject vitals monitoring micro activity monitoring which we have also achieved not only in the lab but in the some real life settings as well but the important step is now to go to multi subject activity monitoring uh, for macro activities and then multi subject activity monitoring for micro activities and all of this uh is actually an ongoing work gradually moving away from the lab into a real world scenario and we can monitor now uh people's standing up sitting down postures as well as their heartbeat and other health vitals as well and this is a snapshot of a uh, live lab based living setup uh, where we have achieved it for multiple subjects as well as you can see four people sitting here their health vitals can be monitored using uh a glasgow based usrp based uh, transmitter and a receiver and in order to sub- focus on multiple subjects one another uh, great innovation that is happening across the globe for future is reconfigurable intelligent surfaces and these reconfigurable intelligent surfaces modify the capability of any surface around you for example your walls your ceilings even your carpet floor how they behave in response to any impinging wireless or rf energy on them and if we can control them we can control the wireless channel in favor of good quality wireless communication so far our whole focus has been on improving the transmitter or improving the receiver in its performance now we are going one step further and try to control something which previously was just taken as an input that we have to live with so this is another innovation and in the lab we have demonstrated that using this technology we can not only focus on uh, uh, we can not only focus on a specific subject at a time and improve the health monitoring of that subject but at the same time what we can do is use if we have control over the channel and we can focus energy from one point to the other point we can also monitor multiple people simultaneously in the room by changing our focus from one to the other in a time scheduled manner so this is just a simple example of the results if our intelligent reconfigurable surface is switched off as you can even see on this data that uh, it's very difficult even for human eye to tell what is the difference between sitting standing and walking some slight difference i can uh, see with my naked eye about walking but it's very very subtle 
difference. So if you if you use uh, without IRS, if you use our wireless sensing technology, you can see a confusion matrix which tells us uh, like how much we uh, are confident in uh, discovering the sitting posture while actually the person is sitting. And uh, if you look at the success rate, the success rate is very, very crude, very, very bad. So random uh, accuracy reaches around 50%, which is similar to like just tossing a coin. With intelligent reflective sur surface switched on, even naked eye can see significant difference between sitting, standing, and walking uh, wireless channel state information profile. And if we do a more uh, serious analysis of this, and we can see that we have a perfect confusion matrix. Perfect confusion matrix means there is no confusion at all. So random accuracy reaches 100%. So we always detect the right posture uh, using this technology. This work has been published significantly uh, across uh, very well respected, esteemed uh, international generals and presented in different conferences as well. Uh, however, the work goes on and I mentioned about privacy preservation. So we are working on ensuring that all this is done in a privacy preserved manner. So what this entails is that you can use uh, a technology like blockchain or other uh, mechanisms which ensure that only the information that the person wants to share is shared with only those people who really need that information. So having that kind of infrastructure ensures that uh, no one misuses our data. The second uh, side application is uh, we can use uh, passive RFID technology to monitor people's occupancy of different desks. And this is very powerful for future work spaces where after COVID pandemic, people have even now become a bit more convinced that uh, work space can be utilized more efficiently if we are following a hot desking model rather than allocated desk because not everyone is occupying a desk 24 seven. So if you are using a hot desking model, it's important for people to know before they leave their home towards their office, that what is space is available, how much is space is available. So this technology can provide them this information using massive machine type connectivity use case of 5G and in future 6G as well. We have also done work jointly with our partners in University of Surrey and University of Mal Malaya in Malaysia uh, on developing technology which can be deployed at a very short notice without any pre-planning in order to combat uh, disasters. Disasters can be man-made, disasters can be uh, natural disasters. Uh, and how we, uh, what we need as soon as disaster happens, what we need the most is ability to connect in order to, for example, ask for help or health authorities to inform people what is safest thing to do. However, the first thing that we lose is the digital connectivity whenever a disaster happens. So how to reinstate this digital connectivity as soon as a disaster happens. And there are uh, uh, technological advancements, like I mentioned one, self-organized networking. You don't need planning. There is artificial intelligence in the network, which guides uh, some radios or mobile systems which are mounted on drones to let the drones know where should they position themselves, which will maximize the coverage, which will also maximize the lifespan of that emerging emergency response network. And one such network we demonstrated funded by Global Challenges Research Fund and our, uh, with the help of our partners in the University of Surrey, Kingston University in London and University of Malaya. Another uh, significant demonstration we have made is how we can control robotics from a remote distance in order to do some useful work. For example, we have demonstrated that uh, some students in University of Glasgow and some staff in University of Glasgow were able to connect to a robotic arm in China in order to do a lab, a laboratory experiment in China. So robotic arm was able to set up electronic components on a breadboard and then set up the measuring equipment on the breadboard as well in order to take measurements and do the experiment. This requires reliability, safety, security, and as I mentioned before, low latency, otherwise you cannot do uh, a live uh, manual or live control of that robotic arm. We are also working on clean, uh, creating a clinic on the wheels concept where a car or a large vehicle is uh, connected via 5G and all the medical equipment on that vehicle is also connected via 5G. And this, this, this vehicle can then travel across very remote areas of Scotland, the Highlands and Islands, as well as other areas 
uh, villages and other areas uh, where the health facility is not at par with its uh, urban counterparts so the solution works very well because uh, the because because whatever measurements or readings are taken they could be uh, directly transmitted onto the healthcare system and uh, the experience of the user is just as if they are visiting a large hospital uh, in an urban city center as i mentioned our virtual reality has enabled people to be able to access facilities which are very very unique uh, not easily available very expensive to recreate so in this uh, simple demo first minister of scotland uh, was in edinburgh and she was able to connect to a very specialized facility we have in university of glasgow called james watt nano fabrication center in glasgow where even to enter a nano lab you, which is a clean room facility you have to take a specific measure so we cannot bring a lot of students or trainees into that lab physically but we can open up that lab for them using virtual reality and digital connectivity to access it anytime across the year and uh, we have a vision and ambition for wider contribution we are accelerating the business driven 5g uptake across not just uk but across the globe we have contributed to policy and technology hubs at international stage business ecosystems with working with mobile network operators as well as other stakeholders like vending equipment provider and so on and then finally developing new sensing and monitoring use cases because i believe in future uh 6g and follow on technology generations of uh, wireless connectivity communication and sensing will merge together as a combined requirement uh, to be delivered by using rf and wireless connectivity and this has been very widely covered across the globe in uh, multiple uh, national outlets and then we have also uh, taken it as our ambition to reach to much wider community through uh, technical books uh, as well as events uh, where we invite people across the globe to come and share ideas just like you have done this wonderful event uh, and giving us the platform to share our ideas and uh, research directions uh, we are organizing international events in order to continue this mission and uh, with this i stop here and uh, let people ask questions which is the more interesting part of this uh, engagement and session with a thanks to all my team and all my colleagues who have contributed to all these uh, outputs and achievements thank you very much thank you so much professor it was a lovely talk and very succinct i must say very to the point uh, and the, the slides were also very engaging and uh, this is such an important uh, very pertinent topic and i can see from the kind of questions that we have received that uh, the audience is very eager to quiz you so here it goes um, uh, do you mind uh, stopping sharing your screen yeah there we go all right great so the first question that we have here is um obviously there's a lot of talk about the kind of impact 5g has on health and wildlife and it, you know so on and so forth so can we limit the use of 5g to only certain areas because of the kind of negative effect that it can have on wildlife is the first question so first of all the negative impact on wildlife uh, needs to be proven right so there is a lot of myth and less of the science but i would say one thing about this uh, i am not uh, a blind uh, supporter of any technology so of course uh, just because i work in 5g i don't have any commercial or vested interest in 5g i am a researcher right so what i would say is not driven by any commercial interest but i, I would give you one example right so uh, 5g of course those who work in 5g or anything in wireless communication know that it works through radio frequencies and electromagnetic radiation even visible light is electromagnetic radiation visible light is also used for communication even now for advanced communication techniques and even visible light is uh, dangerous for you if you expose your skin too much to the sunlight without any protection you go to a beach you expose yourself you are uh, in danger your skin is in danger just like that any rf technology any rf radiation can be dangerous no question about it right but how do we safeguard ourselves from visible light uh, dangers we uh, control the exposure not just the time but the amount of exposure as well right so same thing is happening with 4g has been happening with 3g and 2g as well there are standardization bodies 
which put restrictions on any network designer how much radiation it can produce and at what level so if there is a mobile base station that can produce higher amount of radiation but it has to create an exclusion zone around it so that no living object or for example even a tree or branch or plant does not come within that exclusion zone right so out of that exclusion zone science has proven that the level of radiation is safe enough right so we have to believe in science or we have to prove it otherwise right so my my answer to that one is there are ipnip and other standards which are there to safeguard human health as well as uh, the wildlife health and safety so uh, if you are following that's uh, definitely uh, important that uh, these standards are actually implemented as well and someone is there to ensure that these standards are implemented so second point is uh, do we want 5g to be everywhere okay not necessarily right so every inch of the world does not have to be covered by 5g and it will not happen very soon because 3g 4g are legacy technologies and they will not be wiped out by 5g in few years or months so they will coexist 5g will start from uh, city centers or even remote locations in rural areas where it is needed for specific use case applications that's actually such an interesting take away that 5g is not going to wipe out the existing 3g 4g technologies they have scope for coexisting and that's very interesting to know uh, okay so the next question that we have here is to do with iot and of course a very pertinent topic too so um, can you tell us a little about the uh, use of iot in the field of medicine so in the field of medicine all the sensors are things they are non living things right so if we can connect all these sensors the uh, usefulness of that data and the clarity of that data is much better so there are less chances of storing the data than transform transferring the data from one place to the other uh, by wrong labeling or by misnaming some files that data can be not as relevant and as safe as the data will be if it is connected wirelessly in a live manner right so in order to connect all those sensors so those sensors could be my wearable watch that i'm wearing it could be my uh, wearable ecg device or something in my cufflink or in my collar which can uh, pick up some signals from my health if they are wirelessly connected they create an internet of things including these things right so uh, connecting them wirelessly through the internet has another added advantage which is it will not go to a local device for saving it will go to the internet and immediately it's accessible to my healthcare professionals someone who is uh, helping and monitoring my health as a nurse so everything goes there and they can see that using a app on their mobile or on a desktop monitoring equipment as well so that's why it's important to connect devices to the internet not just connect them wirelessly right so that's that will be iot for health right so internet of things for health iot is a more general concept in addition to health it's also used for automating homes automating factories uh, automating your street lights and things like that just connecting those cctv cameras that i showed is also an example of internet of things well thank you so much for answering that uh, let's talk about the next question that we have here so a very important question with the kind of geographical diversity that we have in a country like india how successful would we be in implementing 5g in every part of the country and that's so that's such an important question uh, in terms of accessibility how would that happen indeed and uh, i uh, am very lucky and uh, that one of the first paper i wrote when 5g was being developed was uh, actually addressing this this concept of concern and I, i raised a question the title of the paper was will 5g miss its blind side right and do the same mistake which for example 4g and 3g has done by just focusing on urban use cases right because a lot of use cases especially from the point of view of iot are very relevant to rural communities for example monitoring farms or monitoring cattle and livestock right it's not just human health that uh, iot can monitor it's uh, uh, cattle health as well or farm health uh, plant health as well that 
can be monitored using these uh, connected devices. So, and, and I haven't just written that paper and forgot about it. I was very active in, uh, at least in uh, our own country where I live now, uh, to, 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 to ensure that 5G reaches uh, urban communities as well as the rural communities, which, for example, as I showed some examples, might actually benefit more than the urban communities from this technology. And for that, we have been doing a lot of work on overcoming digital divide, because I also believe that this is the divide, which is mother of many other unwanted divides, like education divide, like healthcare divide, and so on. So overcoming digital divide requires 5G or better connectivity services, 4G plus or whatever is more suitable to reach everyone without their geographical location. And there are technological solutions or enablers to do that, reducing the cost of deployment, reducing the cost of maintenance, reducing the cost of how much energy it will need to run and uh, training local people to be able to run those networks without having a very qualified uh, communication or networking degree, right? So all of this is done using technologies like self-organized networking, energy efficient uh, equipment and infrastructure, and uh, uh, providing uh, fiber connectivity for the core network of 5G in rural locations. Or for example, using mainland to even provide coverage to the adjoining or close by islands and highlands in, in Scotland. And uh, as, a, as, a, as a demonstration, how successful Scotland has been in, in keeping its promise of overcoming digital divide is that 5G was switched on in a very remote location of the world called Orkney Islands, even before it was switched on in Glasgow and Edinburgh. So uh, this is possible and this is important as well. However, mobile network operators will not have a business use case to deploy it in urban uh, in rural areas before the urban city centers. So uh, the governments as well as local bodies have to come and develop a toolkit or uh, technology enablers or incentives so that this is done in the right way. Understood. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Let's address the next question that we have here. Um, so a very interesting uh, point here. What components of 4G are being reused in 5G? Given the same spectrum availability, how is 5G actually better than 4G and is 5G being used in underground deployment or mines? Okay, so very interesting question and a lot of it is being reused. That's yes. the short answer, but um, spectrum wise as well, we are reusing some of these spectrum that was dedicated for 3G, 4G, but 5G opens up uh, a new real estate for spectrum, which is millimeter wave based bands. So there 5G can use a very narrow beam, um, short range, you can say, relatively short range communication as well. 5G also enables in that frequency band possibility of having various antennas on the same uh, mobile base station as well as various antennas on a mobile device. And when we have more, more than one antenna, it helps in improving the communication uh, quality because uh, a very simple way to understand that it is brings in diversity in the channel, right? So if one antenna to antenna link is not performing well, maybe the other antenna to antenna link would still provide us good uh, wireless connectivity. So millimeter wave band has opened up new frequency bands. 5G still uses the same uh, physical layer technology like OFDM and other techniques. Uh, however, it does provide some improvements in significant improvements in energy efficiency of the system, the hardware design of uh, those devices, the uh, infrastructure protocol of how different entities in cellular network actually uh, talk to one another to create new connections. And these things have been improved significantly in 5G. And these things have been improved in order to provide lower latency of the connection, as I've highlighted, and to create a capability of accommodating more simultaneous connections than 4G could. Right? And as a side uh, consequence, by opening up more bandwidth and spectrum, uh, the amount of data and the speed at which this amount of data can be transferred has also improved in, in 5G. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, let's move on to the next question that we have here. Uh, and we have picked it up off Twitter. So um, 
are there uh, are scientists actively working on the ethical implications of what technology is doing uh, to society in the coming years and how relevant is i mean how much time and resources are you also in your lab along with your colleagues uh, investing in thinking about the ethics associated with uh, iot ai communications and so on again uh, a very very important and pertinent question to this discussion and uh, first of all as a research scientist i work in engineering even though i work in engineering nothing is uh, above uh, ethical approvals or ethical requirements so just to give you an example if we are doing contact tracing experiments and it involves any humans even if they are students of our own lab we have to get it through ethical approvals from ethics committee at university and sometimes even beyond if we are generating any data and then we are sharing that data even though if we have anonymized the data and we have removed the connection between names and the data associated with that name even if that connection is removed we do not publish and we cannot publish it without ethical approvals then the other aspect this is ethical approvals or ethics consider ethical consideration for doing research but beyond that ethical considerations for creating technology what will be ethical downsides of creating a technology which can monitor people's health of course there is a big downside that technology can be used for monitoring people themselves as well right so uh, again we go through ethical approvals what technology can do we are not uh, going to the extremes of uh, changing any any anyone's uh, genetic makeup but if we are developing technology which can monitor them 24/7 there could be ethical uh, implications so we do go through that process and in order to understand those implications and policy implications better we do work with our colleagues in social sciences and in school of adam adam smith business school in university of glasgow and across the globe as well who are more expert in uh, identifying and uh you can say more scientifically studying those ethical frameworks which will be more suitable for these technologies to mature so it's teamwork uh i look after the engineering but not neglecting or having a blind side to ethics right but at the same time i work closely with my uh, colleagues in social sciences across the globe to look more carefully at ethical implications of all these technologies someone has mentioned artificial intelligence as well so of course there are ethical implications of that but at least i can say i'm not sure it might be a question afterwards but i can say very briefly that ai is not a threat to our own jobs humans have a gifted ability to do creative thinking their intelligence goes beyond that artificial intelligence is just like computers and computing has never got rid of humans to do the job it just helps them to do it more efficiently so same thing with ai as well It was incredibly insightful, Professor. Really uh, uh, insightful uh, answer there. So the next question is also very interesting. Uh, how does uh, do you think five G has any implications in climate change? Do you think it will be useful in our battle against climate change? Indeed, it has a huge potential, and the potential comes with uh, two pronged, uh, you can say, opportunity. So one of them is. Uh, the mobile connectivity mobile communication and ict in general is creating not very significant but sizable uh, you can say uh, or noticeable contribution to carbon footprint right so around 4 4% say for example right although the rest of the 96% is coming from other areas but the powerful thing is that ict has a potential or capability to influence that other 96% as well and this conference happening now is one example right so if for example we were not using uh, information technology and this uh, zoom connectivity i may have flown down to uh, delhi right so that would have created a much higher carbon footprint so that carbon footprint saving has occurred because of this opportunity of having this digital connectivity right so in future as well 5g and digital connectivity in general has a huge potential to reduce travel for example but even if we go beyond that wireless communication and uh, digital connectivity provides us an opportunity to monitor people's energy behavior and provide them some feedback 
about how they can improve their energy behavior in short term as well as long term and that is the only way to overcome the challenge of uh, net zero emissions because everyone has to play a part and their role in achieving this very very big ambition it's it's not achieved just by reducing our emissions uh, some of the developing nations need to do those emissions to develop right it's their chance and their turn to develop so they should continue doing that but at the same time they should see where uh, we can have a positive contribution to either offset carbon or uh, to change our energy behavior so that we are we are wasteful in using energy we should reduce that waste thank you so much professor let's move on to the next question that we have over here and we'll also be mindful of the time maybe last few questions now because the one hour has really sped by before we got to know um so the next question that we have here is uh, do you think that the implementation of 5g is being rushed right now uh, many modern flagship chipsets with 5g modems are having serious heating issues so that's very specific but uh, would you say that the implementation is being uh, uh, rushed uh i i would say that there is always a rush when a new technology comes in the market and people want to be so this this rush is driven by the desire to be the first to do something right and uh, this is not being rushed forcefully by anyone this is being driven by market trends right and pandemic has not been very helpful there have been delays and people have been trying to catch up usually uh, these uh, cellular technologies work on a decade scale right so uh, and they're very very timed with the uh, definition of the decade as well so 2020 to uh, 2030 would be a decade of 5g and people wanted to be coming up with solutions at the beginning of 2020 despite the pandemic also hit us at the beginning of the 2020 so they were delayed by one or two years but after that whatever came we have to keep in mind that there were disruptions to all these fabs and factories across the globe because of pandemic and i think if there are any issues which have been detected in some cases they have been detected even in 4g there were phones uh, which caught fire on flights right so this has happened with 4g as well not just 5g so there is still a way to correct it at the moment but it's a market driven thing no one has uh, pushed them to develop products uh, and deploy them at an early stage that makes a lot of sense I and mean, the competition that exists in the market seems to be uh, the reason why we might have uh, yes. you know, the push for <laughs> 5g to just come out in the market might be more competitive uh, than required okay so the next question is also very interesting apart from governments and universities working on 5g are there any big companies say industry driven uh, which are involved in bringing this technology to everyone and could you share some light on this thing yes indeed so uh, large companies are all working all big vendors i i, I would avoid naming them uh, so i work with uh, all of them nearly right so that's why naming some of them and then missing someone else might be a problem but everyone if they if you pick up your phone and read the name of the vendor these are the companies which have been uh, pushing it just because there is a huge commercial opportunity here right so 5g is making digital connectivity as a critical service in our daily lives right it's 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 very quickly becoming just like uh, uh water food shelter and digital connectivity right so many people cannot imagine now living without digital connectivity their first concern while go, going on a uh, vacation leave or holiday is how we would have connectivity there right so all of these things are driving huge commercial opportunity for these large companies so they are investing heavily in developing the technology and they are also working with the uh, governments as well as working with academia to uh, to you can you can say steer the direction of development of technology as well as deployment of technology okay uh, professor there's uh, one question that uh, i think uh, we will take up uh, we will probably take up as the last question of the session before concluding so uh, 
can you can you tell us why is there so much of misinformation that is going around about 5G 60 is there a um, I mean, is there a propaganda behind it there seems to be so much noise about the negative aspects of 5G um, and we really are a lot uh, we are at a loss to understand whether if if it's true or half of it is fake news so can you shed some light on the same i think uh, people who are spreading that uh, fake news and that misinformation about these technologies should pause for a moment and think about it they are being enabled by these previous versions of exactly these technologies right 3g and 4g to to even do this job right this misinformation would never be there if we did not have this social media and this ability to tweet things in few seconds and say whatever we want to say without relying on any science behind it right so uh, i would say 5g or or digital connectivity is a victim of its own success in that sense they have connected people they have allowed people to say anything they want which is uh, very empowering and freeing up uh, a lot of people but at the same time now we are facing this challenge that we are producer as well as consumer of information so quality of information we are getting is because anyone can produce anything right and say oh this is this is a fact and we are consuming it so i think our responsibility has increased that we should try to tune to the right sources of getting that information don't get medical advice from me and don't get uh, advice about 5g from uh, people who just have uh, some wish list about that technology Thank you so much, Professor. That makes a lot of sense. And I mean, we have so many questions in the Q and A box still talking about you know the implications of five G in military in autonomous navigation. And I only hope we had more time to take questions. But that brings me to my final question of the day. And this is something we ask all of our speakers. So uh, you have been um, actively talking about five G in public public engagement platforms. And I would love to know what you think about. Um, events such as india science festival in bringing forth credible science to the masses what's your take on science communication and how important do you think such platforms are to uh, bridge the gap between science and society i am very grateful shruti you asked this question because i am uh, really really fond of those public engagement events where general public can be engaged with ideas about science right and i think it provides us as the scientists and researchers an opportunity to train ourselves as well to to describe technology science and power of this technology and science to general public in terminologies and wordings which are which is accessible to them as well and i'm really sorry if i was using uh, at some stage very technical uh wording on describing something because this becomes our day to day life this is like we speak this language day to day it's very difficult to then uh translate it for you but i tried my best not to use uh, jargon or too much technical wording but these science festivals are really really powerful to inspire the younger generations who have to continue doing this kind of work in future because again because of the social media and because of um, the digital connectivity solution that exists nowadays many people are or many youngsters are trying to find shortcuts to achieve their goals they think uh, without studying or without going through this hard training and learning they would be able to do things so uh, my message is to those youngsters that if there won't be any innovations to market you can't market them right so don't just focus on soft skills and the skills where you will just talk about technology and deliver market that technology there won't be anything to market if you don't get inspired and come and develop these technologies thank you so much professor that was a lovely note to end on and we're so happy that we had the pleasure of hosting you at india science festival and like i mentioned uh, to you earlier we can only hope that in the coming years we get to host you in, uh, in india uh, at a festival that happens on ground um, in an offline setting where you get to interact and answer all the questions that our attendees have for you sure. in a very close personal space and tell them about the wonders of 5g and for 
possibly 6G and possibly 7G in the coming years. So thank you so much for your time. And this is a big thank you from the entire team for sparing your precious time for India Science Festival. Thank you very much, Shruti, to you as well as all backstage uh, supporters. Thank you. Hey!